So the starting point is to understand demolition in its broadest form. So you've either got full demolition, which is where you're demolishing the entire structure, or you've got partial demolition. Now that could include refurbishment or as is often the case at the moment where we're demolishing part of the structure um, and then rebuilding part of it and extending it with a number of stories, that would be partial demolition. Now for full demolition, you can use deliberate collapse mechanisms, which is the big fancy ones, which we all like watching, which is pull downs and blow downs. Uh, pull down being where you use normally an excavator or a bulldozer to, to actually um, pull a structure over, you pre-weaken it, and then you use a piece of plant to, to apply a load, which then causes the structure to collapse. Blow down, similar, you pre-weaken the structure. They don't always have to pre-weaken the structure. Uh, and you use explosives to demolish the structure. Now, you can use cutting charges, and they have their own problems to cut steel and concrete structures, and kicking charges to then kick them over. Uh, or you can go and you can pre-weaken manually and then just use kicking charges, or, or you can use a combination of all three um, for that deliberate collapse mechanism. Progressive demolition, and indeed full demolition of a structure, top down, uh, often used in city centres where you've got restricted access as it sounds you work from the top of the building down typically lifting plant from it might be as small as a one ton machine or a small brock up to typically a 15 tonner depending on the structure and what it can cape with uh, on top of the building and then you just demolish it working within the own footprint of the building. High reach is where you use a high reach excavator so that's a special piece of kit um, normally modified specifically for demolition with increased counterweight, um, a long arm on it, and that allows it to reach high up onto a structure and then into the building with a tool to either a breaker, a muncher, um, or pulverizer, whatever you need to do to do the demolition. Deconstruction and dismantling, that is where you take a building apart, pretty much the reverse of building it, uh, except you might use wire sawing or burning, or you might unbolt things to, to dismantle it. I've got a feeling that traditional dismantling is going to uh, increase somewhat because there's a that drive currently to reuse steel. Um, and there's lots of people looking at how we can reuse steel that's been um, already used once in a structure by taking the building apart and it goes off to be checked, to be graded and have plates and what have you removed if required. And then it will come back to site for the new build or it might have been reused on site. Typically, you might have a combination of all three of these, so it wouldn't be unusual to do top down for, say, the top five, six stories till you can reach it with a high reach. And you might even use a little bit of dismantling with the top down work. So you might break out the slabs and then dismantle the steel frame. There's, there's all sorts of options when it comes to demolishing a building. But that's the, the kind of the broad brush approach to what it is and what it means. So people still have this image in their head that demolition is uncontrolled, is unscientific, and is just involves people bashing things down and blowing things up. Um, this is, and it does still happen in America, actually. They use wrecking balls quite a lot still in the States. I don't think I've ever seen one, or well, I haven't seen one used in a long time in the UK. They still have their place, but they're not the most controlled method for bringing a structure down, unless you've got plenty of room around you. So not typically seen in the UK. Now that's that's what the image people have in their head is that a crane with a wrecking ball. What it actually is, particularly in the UK and Europe, is um, a fairly technical and um, yeah, fairly technical with quite a lot of investment in plant machinery and people. In fact, to to make these demolition jobs happen. So as a little snapshot there, and some of these are going back a few years now. So this is. 2012, 2013, Birmingham New Street, where Coleman's had a, and JCB worked together to produce a custom excavator that was remote controlled specifically for a job called the Mega Muncher. Um, Brox, robotic, remotely controlled machines for doing demolition. So if it's hazardous for someone to be working nearby, then a Brock is a great, a great piece of kit. Um, they pack a lot of punch anyway but particularly where you want to keep your operators well out of harm's way, they're used quite regularly. Demolition spec excavator here, that is a high reach. That is the biggest one 
in the UK. It might be the biggest one in the world. I can never quite keep up. That's owned by DSM and it weighs in over 200 and something tonnes. Can reach, I think, 70 metres up in the air and 15 metres out and run a big tool at the end of it as well. So that is some piece of kit. You, the picture there doesn't quite do it justice, but when you stand near it, you will appreciate the size of that machine, as I have done. And again, up at the top there, you've got Coleman Company specialist cranes developed uh, specifically to allow the dis uh, demolition and dismantling of gas holders. And then on the bottom right there, we've got a scheme we did with Hockteeth and Kilnbridge to take out a walkway over a railway, uh, Manor Park in London. Again, not your run-of-the-mill solution, not, not people getting in there and knocking it down with hammers. It's a properly engineered, thought-out demolition sequence to, to comply with the constraints of the scheme. What is, that? is that top bar showing up for you, Josh? Uh, I can see the bridge with the SPMTs on there. Yeah, so that black bar hasn't come down and blocked no, no. the top of the screen. That's no. just my screen. That's fine. So uh, then here's another example of a, a quite a complex and interesting demolition scheme, taking out a pair of 230-metre-long viaducts in central Liverpool and using fairly specialist kit in terms of SPMTs. And you can see the temporary works and the engineering involved in allowing that to be done, especially with the timescales that evolve. And similarly again there, another one in Leeds that we did with Sam Evans and for Balfour BT, taking out a post-tensioned um, three-span three structure. Again, it's not, it's nothing um, easy about it. It's all technical, properly engineered, thought out work. So what does BS 5975 have to, stay, have to say on the subject of demolition? If you go back to the 2008 version, I don't think demolition even got a mention. However, it does get quite a lot of a mention now within 5975. Before we go into that though, the refresher for all of you, I'm not gonna read it out, but that is the description of what temporary works is and what it's used to do. Uh, quite a wide ranging, broad definition within 5975-2019. So within 5975, they have a list of, a non-exhaustive list of what they mean by this. And you can see demolition appears quite a lot. Supporting or protecting either an existing structure or the permanent works during construction, modification or demolition. And that in itself covers so many things that you couldn't even list them all. Provision of stability, again, during construction, pre-weakening or demolition. Uh, providing measures to control dust, debris, fume, air quality, groundwater, or any site discharges during construction or demolition. Facilitate testing, pre-demolition floor load testing. So what does that, I think I've missed, one's disappeared there. So what does that mean in practice? Uh, so starting off with protection, You've got track protection. So when you're doing railway or even road bridge demolition, you need to protect whatever's going to remain. Um, typically done with navy mats or bog mats or whatever you want to call them. Sometimes sitting on wood, sometimes sitting directly on the road surface, sometimes on field core. It all depends on the constraints, what the contractor likes to do, how they like to work, how flat the ground is. So for a road, you can normally just chuck them straight on the, the road surface. Um, you might put a bit of crush down on top of the mats. It all depends on the demolition you're doing. For a railway, uh, particularly if the bridge is on it or the, the, the railway is on a curve, <clears throat> the ground is very, very unlikely to be flat or level. And it's not advisable to start messing with ballast profiles, particularly on railways, on, on tangent, on curve track, um, because it's been designed and the, the ballast sits there for a reason to stop the track moving particularly if you get high temperatures. So you don't want to start messing around with reprofiling ballast. So typically we either put down fill core blocks, which is a high grade polystyrene with mats over the top, or you would go with uh, timbers, bulk timbers to deck out the area and then put your navy mats on top. Either way, it's uh, if you've never done it before, it's actually quite a time or can be quite a time consuming thing to deck out and protect the railway in particular properly. Road's normally a lot easier, as I said, because you can chuck it straight on the road, generally speaking. Um, supporting or protecting either an existing structure. So 
a lot of times uh, now we are not demolishing the whole structure um, both for environmental reasons and planning makes it far easier to justify knocking part of a structure down and reusing part of it uh, and also i think the vat break as well doesn't it? if you're refurbishing a structure i don't think you have to pay vat whereas if you're building new you do i might have that around the wrong way but anyway it's there's a, a lot more of a move towards keeping what you can in a structure if it's of a suitable uh, quality and that in itself brings in challenges with keeping the remaining structure stable typically the core is being removed i think in every scheme i've looked at the core is being removed which is what normally provides a building with stability. So that core comes out, you've got to prove that the structure remains stable and you've got to do it in such a way that is uh, that it works with the constraints of the site, which can be a challenge in itself. And on the left there, you've got an example of a fairly simple tension bracing system. And on the right hand side, you've got tension bracing system coupled with uh, facade retention for the top two floors. You've also got, when you get further down the structure, if you're taking out the ground floor slab and you've got a basement, chances are you're going to need to do something to make that basement stable. Um, this is quite a good example where we were brought in to a project where the previous engineer had determined that the entire basement needed propping um, and had put hundreds of thousands of pounds of steelwork into this basement to, to keep it stable. We came in and um, looked at it did the design work, looking at the, um, the fact there's vaults around it and you've got structures either side with basements and engineered out the majority of the propping and then designed uh, the thrust block to use the permanent raft just with a, a thickening added to it to keep it all stable. But again, a good example there of supporting permanent works during the construction or modification phase of the works. A uh, bit more, well, not necessarily high tech, but I think a technically challenging one here is the top left there, which is centre point. So that's the top of centre point tower, some 30 something storeys above central London, where I think it was the top two floors were removed, though Josh will know as he did a lot more work on it than I did. Yeah, uh, it's the top, it was pretty much two floors, but there was, there was multiple levels in there. I think it was three floors four. and then the roof. Um, that, that deck that you can see in there, um, is the formwork for uh, a new floor slab. So then you can imagine there's another three meters of um, no structure between those large shear walls. It was quite a kind of a cavernous space once we opened all that out and had to design the, um, the stability uh, bracing that you can see there, the orange um, RMD supports there to ensure that the top of the tower remained stable. And then on the right hand side, and you'll probably be familiar with facade retention. You can't help but walk around the city and find a structure that's got a facade retention in place. Um, it happens quite regularly where you've got to keep the facade, but you want to develop the building. And that's a RMAC job in Leeds and Majestic, which is now Channel 4's headquarters, I think. Um, and well worth keeping. Sometimes we do facade retentions on facades and you wonder why on earth we're keeping them. But at the Majestic, you could actually see why we went to all that trouble. That's another view within Centre Point Tower itself of quite how big a space that was created there at the top of the tower. I think it was for some new penthouse suites, I think, from memory. Uh, providing measure to control noise, dust, debris, fumes, etc., from site discharge. So, top left there, you've got a, what we call a demolition curtain, which is a uh, a long strip of rubber I don't know, probably five to ten meters wide and however tall you need it that is suspended by a crane and that protects uh, adjacent buildings should a piece of rubble not a large piece of rubble but a small piece of rubble be ejected from the site inadvertently it just prevents any damage scaffold now scaffolds are a funny one scaffold with top down is fairly typical uh, scaffold with Long with high reach demolition, it's not ideal. In fact, we've seen over the past few years quite a number of scaffolds that have failed. Well, it's not the scaffold that's failed, it's the building inside has failed. 
during the demolition works, which has then caused part of the scaffold to collapse. Uh, I think there's at least four or five now. The scaffold will not stop a building falling down unless you're lucky and it just happens to take it. It's not designed to do that. Scaffolding relies on the structure it's tied to for stability. So if you're demolishing that structure and you have a partial collapse, you can't expect the scaffold or you wouldn't be able to demonstrate that the scaffold would stay in place and stop the building collapsing any further. Um, chances are you're going to get a collapse of the scaffold unless you get lucky. So that's a challenge that many demolition contractors face. AR demolition have come up with a solution, which is their, their screen called Big Blue, which they've used a number of times across the country. So you can see there this screen, this big screen on the left hand side, um, which is designed to take impact loadings and prevent if, if something goes wrong when you're using a high reach to demolish your structure, that frame is designed to stop it getting outside the site where the scaffold wouldn't do that. But you need quite a lot of space. So it doesn't work everywhere or clients like uh, councils or whoever owns the buildings need to start getting on board and understanding that scaffolding will not stop a collapse. And really you should just be shutting the road in front of the building while you do the demolition. Uh, but I'll, I'll discuss that a bit more later when I have my whinge page. Facilitating of testing, so pre-demolition floor load capacity testing, very, very common thing to be done to prove that a um, structure can take the loads with a sufficient factor of safety. And often you'll find that by load testing, you'll get more capacity than you can prove through traditional elastic methods. Um, which kind of feeds into this idea that maybe buildings are over-designed. Again, that's a, a bit more in-depth one to go into there, but if we can put, I don't know, a 15 ton excavator on a slab that's designed as a, an office building, there's got to be something wrong there, isn't there, in terms of the design that we're doing at the beginning, which then feeds back into the amount of embodied carbon, et cetera, et cetera. But probably one for a different day than today. But suffice to say, generally, we get more capacity through load testing than we do through analysis. Though, what you've got to be careful is that A, it's representative. Uh, B, you look at bending and shear uh, because a slab might do very well in bending, but you might not get the punt, the shear capacity that you require out of it. And secondly, you've got to make damn sure that what you're testing is representative of the whole building. And obviously, the harder you push a structure during demolition, the more chance that you reveal a latent defect if you're pushing it harder than the loads the structure has ever seen before uh, and there is a latent defect in there you will probably uncover it and that can be crazy things that you wouldn't even think are possible in the past we've seen um we've seen slabs that should have been should have had pull out reinforcement all the way around all four corners within a core structure or within concrete wall structure uh, and they only had like two or three bars in place which clearly worked for however long the building had been in use, but had it been loaded by plant, you would have had a big problem. Uh, simple things like that, where if you're testing it, you've got to be damn sure that what you're testing is representative, as I said, uh, and perhaps even then not push the building quite as hard as you might like. Uh, this, I think this is out of the NFDC guidance, which I believe was put together by Holly, I forget her surname, Holly from Galbraith and Tim Lohman from Wentworth House. And there's no point me reinventing the wheel. This is available free in the NFDC guidance on Temporary Works. I think someone's probably now going to tell me this has been updated, but I forgot to update it. Anyway, I don't think it makes a great deal of difference. This is kind of a list of what, of how you would classify a temporary works related to demolition. So at the top here, you can see um, things like scaffolding, formwork up to six meters, uh, crane outriggers, concrete pump positions, welfare cabinets, et cetera, are fairly low to medium risk. Specialist becomes medium to high risk, which is propping on multiple levels, demolition and temporary conditions generally. Specialist scaffolds, Excavation using whaling frames, back propping designs. Um, and then you get into the more complex thing, which is multiple uh, interactive, multiple designs. So I'm guessing that's where you're looking at perhaps a geotechnical interface and a, a structural interface, or where you've got one person designed one thing and another company designed another thing, and you're looking at that interface. 
uh, again that's something that um, it's normally that that's normally where you have mistake is where there's one designer's doing this one designer's doing this but nobody's looking at how those two interact uh, and that's often where where the issues arise uh, unusual concepts facade retention close to public areas bridge demolition partial demolition of an existing structure um, any, any excavations in tidal conditions or poor ground where you're operating demolition plant on suspended slabs um, yeah, I'm not going to read them all but you can read them yourself so there's there's quite a lot of them there but a, a big one there's pre-weakening and collapse schemes for explosive demolition and I would guess pull down as well where the surrounding clear area is less than one building height in all directions which immediately becomes fairly high risk as i say that's out of the nfbc guidance um which is freely available i believe on the nfbc website so pull downs uh if you've watched if you've watched these presentations before you will probably have seen white heart lane i make no apology for repeating it again because uh, i still really enjoy the video and quite what was achieved there was to my mind, fairly impressive pulling down a truss of that size and that weight was, um, yeah, it's a good one and a, and a cracking video. So this is Tottenham Hotspurs Football Stadium, uh, the, the principal truss that supported the original roof. And the original plan was to lift this down with a pair of crawler cranes, fairly large crawler cranes. The problem being that those crawler cranes were engaged on the construction works. Therefore, if they had had to be used for the demolition, they'd have to dereg them, move them over, and you would have lost quite a lot of time on the program. Uh, and a tandem lift of, an, of a truss this size is not a simple undertaking, and you would have to be bang on with the weights. There's a, a lot more risk involved, as we saw it, than the pull down solution, where, okay, there's a little bit of work at height, but once that was done, away you went everybody's in a position to safety the work itself could be well controlled and there was there was no concerns with anybody being injured in terms of during the actual pull down itself so that is the proposal and as i said it's quite a lumpy truss you don't realize quite how big this truss is until you see the picture shortly and there was even a um, contingency plan put in place should it have got stuck at one end and the, the end it was most likely to get stuck at was this end here. Um, so there's a contingency plan in place should it not have pulled off properly. Where's the video gone? There we go, all right, there we go. That is actually the, the beast, that high reach there that we talked about earlier. go easy as that much much safer quicker way of getting that truss on the ground where it can then be processed as required with the machine so and to put that into context that is how big that truss is so you can see how doing a tandem lift on that would not necessarily have been a particularly simple operation but yes yeah, a big lump i think 230 odd tons something like that uh, another good example is of a pull down is this one, which was for HS2 at Wilsdon Junction. Uh, John F. Hunt with the demolition contractor, and then we had a pair of these cranes to take out. The first one was done by dismantling it effectively, and this one was pulled down. Um, and you can see it went exactly as the plan. And it reminds me quite a lot of a, a one of those Walker things in Star Wars. Uh, quite a lot like where the scene where it gets its legs taken out from underneath it. But there you go. Pre-weakening. So pre-weakening is not an area for just anybody to go and get involved. You need to have a good grasp of demolition and a very good grasp of engineering before you start figuring out how to dismantle, sorry, how to pre-weaken a structure. The art of pre-weakening it sufficiently that it 
won't collapse while you're doing it, but it will collapse when you pull it over. And then making sure you communicate that clearly and concisely to the people doing the works. It's um, something you need to have some experience in. And you've got to be sure about the team who are doing it. So workmanship at the burners is vital. The setting out. So you've got to make sure that everybody understands where they're pre-weakening it. So you need a very, very clear drawing as to what's being done and where. The checking, an external check, or maybe a cat two, probably a cat three, depending on the structure, should be undertaken. And that should be by someone who's similarly experienced in these sorts of work. The former cut is very, very important. Thinking about how the structure is going to behave and how you're going to cut it. Um, it's got to be thought through. You need to do the minimum necessary pre-weakening, as I said, to make sure that the structure remains stable while the works are undertaken and, and in any wind loads that can be foreseeable between pre-weakening and pulling down. But enough so that you can put enough energy in to cause the collapse, whether that's through explosives or through machines pulling it either way. The final release cuts should only be undertaken when you're ready for the pull down. So ideally you would leave tabs in place that keep the structure stable until the very last moment. The calculation should be undertaken to justify the design and you need to consider the age of the structure and the material properties. Um, you also need to undertake a sensitivity analysis with particularly with larger structures. You're probably not going to have an accurate weight forecast. Uh, it will come down to people making estimates of the weight of the structure that's being dismantled or being put, sorry, being uh, pre-weakened and pulled down. You therefore need to treat that as a, not as a given, but to consider upper and lower bounds from that estimate to make sure that your, that the structure remains stable throughout. For instance, if you overestimate the weight compared to the loads, the wind loads that are upon it, you might well have a problem. So you need to consider a lower bound weight as well and keep it simple. It's not the place to try and be clever with cutting arrangements and similar. So working platforms, again, quite a large part of what's required for demolition. Um, and particularly when you get machines like this, which, as I said, weighs in excess of 200 tonnes. LPS structures are particularly nasty things to deal with, or they can be. Uh, LPS stands for uh, large panel structure. These are effectively gravity systems, so a bit like a house of cards. You put your walls up, you put your floor slab on, and it's the weight of that floor slab that keeps the wall stable. And as you go up the structure, that is how the, the structure stays together. There are a number of collapses of these back in the 60s, the most probably high, pro high profile one was Ronan Point, where a gas explosion blew out a wall and that caused, I can't remember, was it was 13 so stories or so to collapse off the side of the building. And that led to gas being turned off within all these structures. And it then also led to a round of strengthening. Now. Some LPS structures were strengthened, some were never strengthened. The records of what was strengthened, how it was strengthened, often missing completely. And the quality, A, of the original construction and B, of the strengthening works is highly variable. You really don't know what you're going to find in these structures until you start dismantling them. So you have to plan them with that in mind. And obviously, given the location, there's normally a lot of neighbours around them. So you've got to be very careful in the way that the structure is taken down to avoid a catastrophic collapse or unplanned collapse. So this one, I think it was Edge Baston. I mean, it can be done with high reach, but you've got to be, you've got to make sure the panels are secured adequately and you've got enough room around you to do the work. And you've got to think about maintaining stability so working your way back to the core regardless of whether it's easier to work your way in from one end or not you've got to be working back to a core on these structures if you're going to stand any chance of keeping it stable again that's the that's that beast of the machine that dsm have and you can see there it's reaching up there without any real difficulties whatsoever so i think it's 70 meters you can reach up to 
you can see the demo curtain in places as they're doing the works there as well. And you can see the core being taken down here as well. And the core is typically in situ, though. Some of these buildings had precast cores as well. It all depends. Um, and in terms, as I said, some of them have been strengthened. And in fact, went around a couple probably last year sometime where they belong to the council. They belong to the council all the way through. And at some stage in the past 30 years, they've been strengthened. And yet they still had no information whatsoever of what was done and who strengthened it or why which is fairly shocking but there you go bridges so bridge demolition over road or railway the you've got to protect the assets that are to remain and you've got to ensure the stability of the structure while the works is undertaken so that can be the bits that remain as here which is sas 13 in birmingham which was a um, Skanska job with Armac doing the demolition, doing the demolition works. And we were working for Armac on this one. Interestingly, the cut line was part of the way through an arch at either end. You can just see the red cut line here. And you can see that this, this pier is, is built in the arch, which can make sense, but you had to keep part of the arch. It was the same at the other end. So the permanent works design had actually detailed in a solution to to keep the bridge upright um it needed a little bit of assistance in the temporary stage but it was nice to see that it had been thought about as to how it could be built and how you would maintain stability of the arches rather than just leaving it up to demolition contractor to to worry about and solve on the day well not on the day but to solve as part of their package so sas 13 you have effectively there were three masonry viaducts and a central steel span which was lifted out, I'm going to skip a bit of it because the start of it is the removal of the ballast and the track and the OLE. We don't start the demolition until a little bit further on. You can see the track protection in place there. There's also a culvert here, uh, which made things more challenging, particularly for the new bridge. You can just see the new bridge in the background there, which was is an absolute monster of a steel truss that uh, was put in very shortly after this this came out, the whole idea being you could do the demolition and the bank seats are there ready. You could pretty much land the bridge. I think it was the next weekend, but that is a, a monster span, that bridge. You see there, steel span lifted out and then process the masonry arch. And you see Armac have got all their kit in there, making light work of taking out that masonry arch. A hive of activity because obviously you haven't got long to get it done. There's a new bank seat going back in. And I think I can't, I think it was the next weekend that the, uh, the trust was installed, but you can see more about that online. It's uh, quite an impressive, quite an impressive piece of engineering. I think TGP did the design of the bridge and all the new build parts there. Why is that playing again? There we go. Right. This is what I'm going to call my whinge page. So some of the current issues with well, demolition and temporary works and demolition temporary works in general. So it's very, very frustrating when clients, and when I talk about clients here, I mean the people who are, who are responsible for the projects, uh, they employ a competent demolition contractor and then insist on telling them how the demolition is to be undertaken, uh, which is very, very frustrating for demolition contractors and us. You've, you've gone to the right people, employed the right people, and then you'd want to tell them how to do the demolition works. It doesn't make any sense at all. Then we have schemes with almost impossible constraints due to a lack of thought. Now, this ties in very closely with clients who don't undertake risk assessments of what the contractors... Oops, that's not what I meant to do. They don't consider what they're asking the contractor to do. Uh, a good example of this would be a tower block in a city centre location where the constraints in the tender required that the all the surrounding shops that were within, I don't know, three 
probably less than that, probably actually abutting the structure, uh, had to remain open throughout all of the works, as did the public realm area underneath. So you're supposed to take down a, a huge tower block whilst the public are walking around underneath you. It doesn't take much of a risk assessment to understand that that's not a good idea at all. And this, this also feeds into where we're having these scaffold collapses. If clients would accept that the safest thing to do is to close a road, to do the demolition works, that's what should be happening. But they seem to think that they can push that risk down to the demolition contractor. Uh, whereas I know, at least in a couple of occasions, the HSC is speaking to the clients about those decisions because they're the ones who are dictating these conditions. So it's, it, it's starting to swing back the other way. And again, this feeds into this one, principal designers who have no knowledge of demolition. These three sit together in my eyes. Many, many times we get packages, normally at a tender stage, where you've got constraints that are A, unsafe, or B, haven't been thought through at all. And that's because clients are engaged in principal designers who don't understand demolition. And that produces a tender package that you shouldn't be building, or you shouldn't be doing the demolition that way. That then feeds into the, the, the next wing, which is consultants who have no idea about demolition producing demolition schemes and it, the mind boggles us like me going out and decide I'm going to go and design a 20 story tower in central London. I just wouldn't do it. It's outside of my realms of knowledge and they need to have a little read of their code of conduct for both the IC and the ISRUP team. If you haven't got any competency in that area, you're best off not doing it because you're not actually adding any value at all to your clients, you're producing a series of drawings that are a meaningless waste of paper. This other one I touched on earlier, which is facade scaffolds, will not stop a building collapsing. If, you use, if you're doing top down, probably okay because of the, the amount of material you're moving around. Whereas if you're doing it with a high reach and you get it wrong, you're probably going to push a chunk of scaffold over, uh, which then feeds into this first bit here as to why clients should allow people to close the road in the first place and not insist on trying to do these works with the roads and it shops next to the structure open. Next one's more of a, uh, a feel or more of a discussion about carbon because we've had it on a couple of times now, but I've got one at the moment where the contract break between the demolition contractor and the new build is such that you have to install a load of temporary propping into the structure before the new build contractor comes along and backfills the basement with crush. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You, you, you're putting a load of steel into a building to keep it stable for a couple of months before someone backfills it with fill. It just doesn't make any sense. And from a cost and a carbon perspective, it's not a great idea. Uh, the next one comes when you do a, a design that's been checked and it goes into another engineer uh, who then decides that you have to check absolutely everything numerically. Engineering judgment is okay. If you're competent and you understand what you're doing, you don't have to prove absolutely everything with numbers. Engineering judgment is still allowed. And it's incredibly frustrating to have to spend time proving things that are obvious. Um, obviously you have to put that in the right context. There's times for engineering judgment and there's times when you can't do it with engineering judgment, but Things such as navi mats for crash deck protection don't need a great deal of calculations to prove that they work. And it's very, very easy to get bogged down and decide they don't work. But engineering judgment and previous history shows that they do work more than adequately. And anyway, that's the end of my little whinge. Um, and I'll be interested to see if I have anyone else who chips in with these, agrees with me, disagrees with me. By all means, I'll be quite happy to have a discussion at the end in the Q&A section. And now Josh is going to move on and do his two case studies. I'm going to carry on driving the presentation because he's having trouble with the video showing. But um, yeah, over Thank to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Angus. So now um, on to our first case study, which is um, the Scunthorpe Steelworks and the tale of two chimneys. And the reason why I've chosen these is because they're two examples of dropping a chimney. Um, but each was done using a different methodology due to their location and construction um, because it's not a case of, well, here's a chimney and this is how we do it. Because as we've heard from, from Angus, choosing that demolition methodology, it comes with 
looking at location and the different constraints on a project and the construction, they all have an influence on choosing a demolition methodology. And this is why this is um, a, a good example. The, the contractor um, on this one was uh, S. Evans and Sons, a demolition contractor, and the client was British Steel. Specialist explosive services were the explosive contractor for the, the uh, chimney that was blown down. Um, and we were the demolition engineers providing the design for both. Um, so the first example that we've got here is the pull down or a push down in this case. Um, and this is a steel stack. Um, this structure was approximately five meters in diameter and 56 meters tall. It had an outer shell on um, it was steel, outer shell and internal liner. <clears throat> and I had a significant change of section about five and a half meters up above the base. And this section change and the in intake uh, pipe work that you can see there, that meant that um, we chose to carry out the pre-weakening cuts above this section change, which meant that we had no restrictions on where the pre-weakening was, and therefore we could choose the direction um, that it would fall in, because that was really important as the general idea of this is to, to drop the structure away from risk zones. And the principal risk zone on this one was an ammonia tank that is just creeping into the photo on that left-hand side there. So we wanted to drop this chimney um, in the other direction. Our design was based on a structural justification of the pre-weakening and to ensure that there is enough structure there to resist the destabilizing forces, uh, which are principally wind, like Angus was discussing earlier. And um, what we do um, is break the sequence down bit by bit as it's as it's pre-weakened and cut. And we check each part of the sequence by calculating the properties of each structure at this stage. And if Angus, if you nudge it on another one, we can see that um, we've got a little um, section there where um, we've calculated what that is and what's left and this ensures that the chimney doesn't come down prematurely and, and the trick is to remove enough so it can be pushed over but not, not too much um, so it blows over in a gust of wind also looking at that sensitivity analysis as well. Um, this structure was pushed from behind using a grab attachment on an excavator and that meant that we could saddle that grab with its open uh, jaws onto the curvature of the stack and then we were able to lean on it um, with a suitable force to induce a controlled collapse um, and if Angus you want to go to the next slide and we've got a video of um, how the thing came down um, one sunny morning and then it drops there boom so um, if you jump onto the next slide we've got our other chimney and this was a concrete chimney, much taller than the steel stack. It was 78 metres tall and it weighed nearly a thousand tonnes. Um, it had a concrete outer ring and then a brick, a brick internal liner. There was a large hole on this side of this chimney where the flue came in. And this hole was so large that we couldn't really avoid it. So we had to work with the opening of what we got, incorporating it into that pre-weakening sequence. Um, unfortunately, we were able to make it work so that the chimney dropped into a safe zone and away from the live conveyor systems, which uh, were to the west and the south. And then the, the failure of this chimney was induced by explosives this time rather than pre-weakening and pushing. This was just pre-weakened and blasted. There was a strict preparation sequence which involved um, test blasts to make sure we had enough bang in our buck um, to do what we wanted to do. Pre-weakening. Um, heel cuts on the back of the chimney and some hole drilling for the explosives as well and uh, the, the design check included the review of the structure at each stage and calculate, uh, calculating that stability and Angus if you want to give it a nudge we can see an example of the um, section that we've got there um, after the pre-weakening which had to support the vertical weight as well as the destabilizing wind loadings which are trying to push that chimney over. Slide. Once all the planning was in place, the demolition works could then commence. Um, and the, the idea with any pull down or blow down is to get the structure onto the ground so that it can be processed using heavy plant working on the ground. We essentially want to reduce the, um, the working at height due to it being the most dangerous activity in the construction industry. And this type of demolition, yes, it's high risk, but it's for a very short period of time and controls such as a site-wide exclusion zone can be implemented to keep the overall risk lower than um, alternative methods. Um, so if we go to our next slide and we can see um, a video of how it went on uh, one 
Sunday morning. So you can see there we've got the chimney. Um, you can see that there's um, infrastructure around it, the conveyors. It's been pre-weakened at this point and some um, blast protection there just to make sure we're not getting demolition fly firing out um, blasted. And then slowly tipping away from the areas of high risk and into a, a drop zone. And it went down the, the, exactly the direction we wanted it to go. It, we didn't, it wasn't meant to fall onto that stockpile to the left. That was just a stockpile of material. We were, uh, wanted it just to fall in that direction and away from the live conveyor systems. Um, and it went down very well. And then could then be processed and, and um, uh, on the ground where it's safe. So onto our next case study then, which is, um, a little bit different from the chimneys. Uh, this is a cut and carve type job with partial demolition of a, a large structure in a, a busy city centre. This is more of a progressive realisation of um, demolition uh, as opposed to the chimneys where once it starts, you blink and it's, it's down. The contractor for this one was uh, P.P. O'Connor, the, uh, the demolition contractor, and the client was Property Alliance Group. And we were the demolition engineers providing engineering support for uh, P.P. O'Connor. Way back at tender stage, we assisted in the tender um, design and, and engineering to support PP O'Connor's tender. They successfully won the job and then we supported them throughout their uh, contract work. So slide, please. So the existing site consisted of a two to three storey basement car park over the whole site. Um, the main works involved the demolition of half of the existing superstructure and its associated basement onto the north which is up the page and then uh, in that footprint was then going to be built a new basement and a 27 story residential tower the existing basement was retaining uh, the, the roads around it um, including victoria bridge and then during the works the exterior roads and the bridge were still in use and then we had a, a single lane closure on a couple of roads there were several temporary works elements associated with them the, the, the demolition and upon reviewing the scope of work at tender stage with PP O'Connor, there was certainly more than one way to skin a cat on this one. There was lots of different methods we looked at, but we uh, workshopped them and we came up with what we believed was um, the most efficient way to get the structure down. So slide, please. The methodology that we went with was to carry out a partial top-down demolition of the superstructure um, and then um, the extent once that extent had been completed, then we could bring a high reach excavator and, and bring that in to remove the uh, lower areas, which is um, shown here. So because this is quite a large um, excavator to enable us to remove the structure that we wanted to, we had to um, include some um, quite heavy duty back propping. Um, because this excavator, it was about 80 tons, I think. And uh, then once the excavator uh, high reach excavator demolished the superstructure down to ground level then we could bring in smaller excavators such as like 30 tonners with demolition spec and tools to remove the basement substructure. Um, removing the substructure left us with uh, quite a significant challenge so in order to ensure that the surrounding ro roads um, were adequately supported uh, part of the existing car park structure was left in place and we worked with the project team quite early on to develop a suitable demolition scope that included leaving a bay of the structure in that was then braced with proprietary kit to provide um, support to the perimeter. On the right hand side we can see some archive photos of the structure as it was being built during the 70s and we could tell from these photos that there was a minimal temporary works um, that they used to construct it and support those walls and large buttress wall that supported Dean's Gate Road. That's along um, the top there. Uh, but unfortunately, we were unable to gather enough information on this structure to remove the requirement of temporary works altogether. However, um, it did mean that we were able to make our design much lighter than it would have been had there been no wall at all. Um, information and good insight, uh, good site investigation um, drives efficiencies like this and ultimately saves uh, time and money and reduces risk. Good engineering solutions are driven by good information and good information is well worth the upfront investment. 
Uh, the overall methodology of construction was decided uh, very early on, as I said, and this ultimately drove the demolition, demolition scope um, and therefore uh, drove the demolition methodology as well, how we were going to tackle it. And it's really important to understand the sequence as a whole of how the whole project is going to be realised to ensure that we're all working towards the same buildable goal because um, it links back to what Angus mentioned about splitting contracts um, and his good example of the, lots of propping being installed when it was not required because we were going to be backfilling anyway. Having a good understanding and taking a holistic approach of the whole sequence um, uh, is, is important in my eyes. The sequence is generally to demolish the structure, leaving a, a brazed bay um, to support the road. Then the piled retaining wall could be installed on the perimeter, which then enabled a lower basement slab to be constructed, which then the pile wall can be propped from this um, new basement slab, therefore making that brace bay redundant. And then once that brace bay is demolished, then the rest of the structure can be uh, constructed with the blue propping removed as it becomes redundant. Um, and that's quite, that kind of sequence is um, a common one for this, this basement type approach. Slide. And here we've got a couple of photos of the demolition works nearing completion and some of that propping in place. And I've highlighted the propping in orange on that photo to give you an idea of where it was. Uh, we used um, existing walls where we could um, and only had the propping in where it was um, absolutely necessary. Looked at the frame as well, analysed that um, existing frame to make sure that the forces within that frame were, were acceptable. Um, and you can also see some lighter cut line propping that we had there, and that was required to um, to support that demolition line between what was going and what would remain. Uh, next slide. And this solution was uh, that we went with was to use as much of the existing structure as possible, which you can see here. That's that that end bay remaining, um, and this reduced the amount of propping that was imported onto site and cut down on installation time as well. Uh, which all follows our, our mantra that we have at Andon, which is no temporary works is the best temporary works. We try to use as, as much as we can in terms of existing structure or the permanent structure that's going to be used to eliminate um, redundant uh, temporary works, essentially. Next slide, please, Angus. And then here we can see some more of that cut line temporary works. And I took this photo as part of the handover that was required from the demolition contractor to the... Um, to the client was to provide um, some ad built drawings, um, which could then be adopted by the incoming contractor who had the task of construction that new structure. But it shows there we've got a nice smooth cut line as we were demolished up to the that area. Um, it, we left half a meter or so on, and then that that was trimmed off a nice neat cut line ready for the, the permanent works. Um, these two projects really illustrate to me how important um, it is to get the correct methodology in the first place. The right methodology changes from job to job or client to client, you know, structure to structure, which is why it's a, um, really good that uh, trusted and good relationships between the project team lead to good projects. I say good, but that's meaning kind of safe and successful projects that are delivered on time. We work with many of our clients early on and even at tender stage to provide that engineering uh, input, which assists in choosing the right method and the temporary work solution. So, you know, some of those support that we provided are listed there, um, but that's kind of um, our, our preferred approach. Um, that leads us to the end of the presentation. Um, if you um, want to know more, there's a host of information out there. This presentation certainly isn't everything you need to know and far from it. Um, there's plenty of information. We've got the Tempe Works Forum, uh, which has got lots of um, great information, free downloads. There's 5975, which Angus mentioned earlier, which is almost the Bible for Tempe Works, the British standard for Tempe Works, which is a British standard, and it, but it is still uh, current. That hasn't been superseded by Euro norms. Um, the national, uh, the NFDC document Angus is talking about there, that's the uh, up-to-date version, 2019 publication. It's better than me, he put the, he put the latest version in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the latest <laughs> version. And that is a free yeah. download and it's uh, not very long, um, but it's uh, a good read. It, it takes most of uh, all the salient points, really. Um, yeah, so we'll take a short break, really, just to let some of your 
cogs in your mind tick and start putting some questions in. But we'll take um, questions very shortly. 